Welcome to our second weekend of uh, PXR 2020. Uh, PXR is brought to you by uh, Single Thread and Electric Company Theater. And uh, we are also uh, grateful to our community partners, Toaster Lab, Langara Center for Entertainment Arts, and especially the Canada Council for the Arts Digital Strategy Fund. Uh, we'd like to acknowledge that we have organized this event primarily on the traditional ancestral an unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, uh, the Squamish, the Salitut, and the Musqueam nations. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce you to uh, Catherine Bourgeois. Uh, she's actually waiting for us in the, uh, the world beyond this one. Uh, and uh, Catherine is one of the first people who um, agreed to, to present at uh, PXR. And I, I really am excited about the work that she's doing. Uh, so this presentation is going to be exploring the parallels between the genre of theater and virtual reality and the dramaturgical journey between them. Uh, Catherine is going to speak to the goals, objectives, and experience of creating her mixed reality piece, Violette, uh, as well as the urgent need for uh, and need of diverse groups of creators working in VR and forging paths to develop wider audiences. So. Um, I'm going to give you a choice. I'm going to do a belly portal. I don't know if you've, any of you have taken part in a belly portal, or you can go through this teleporter if it does not work for you. So I'm going to, uh, let's see here. Give me one second. Bear with me. Uh, let's see. Oh, this is exciting. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Let's see here. Give me one second. You'll know that you've done it successfully because there'll be a line extending. Look at that. Isn't that amazing? And if this doesn't work and you're left behind, <laughs> you can go through the teleporter just to my uh, my left, your right. Okay, here we go. Over here, fit this way. You don't hear the noise, do you? No. Okay. Hi, Alex. Uh, I've, I've, I've done the intro, so once we get everyone over here, we can. Perfect. Let so, know, uh, are we waiting uh, for more people? Uh, I'm, I'm going to get Deborah back into the Zoom. Uh, you're able to hit play on this? Yeah, I try. I practice, and I'm good with it. Yeah. Okay. Cool. I'll just go thank you. back and see if we've missed anyone. Perfect. Thank you. I guess James didn't make it or something. Yeah, Alex went back to go get the stragglers. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. But you can also, you can invite anyone who you are friends with that didn't make it, you can, you can invite them. Oh, okay. Yeah. So if you go to your menu heads people. up display, your menu and your people, and then you can just send them a message that says, come visit. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, it's pretty handy when you lose people. The only problem is, is they don't actually port right to you. They port to the spawn point. So you can't like oh, right. have them actually come to you and 
right, right. where you're standing, but. It's actually amazing that we haven't had more problems like this with all the porting and jumping around. I mean, yeah, like any conference, the, the logistics are almost the hardest part, right? Just totally. People. Yeah, but, uh, but the number of times that I've wanted the schedule and the location in my hand so that I could know. Oh, Oculus. Oh. Hello, oh. oh he's saying the Quest isn't working. He's saying yeah, the we're having a couple port. technical issues. Um, sorry about the delay and all of this. We will, we will assist you as soon as possible. Thank you for your patience. Much love to all. Who loves technology? Throw some hearts up. Isn't everything and every day a learning experience? Oh, Thanks yeah. so much. Uh, <laughs> Thanks, we'll Aiden. update you as soon as we can. Um, feel free to mingle, Catherine. I'll speak to you in <laughs> just a second. Send you a couple messages and yeah. Enjoy the world, yeah. hop around, fall off the edge. It's quite an experience. <laughs> <laughs> Thank this you. This is where we need virtual snacks and coffee. Oh, oh my gosh, yeah. Uh, this is where I'd go to the craft table and <laughs> yeah, get a bonbon. Bon. <laughs> oh my gosh, yes. That would be, um, we were talking about it the other day, actually how fun it could potentially be to, it would be a logistical nightmare, but to like schedule, skip the dishes, to deliver everyone. <laughs> yeah. up there. Right, Yumi? Right? Yumi? Like, yeah, I have a message. I was, from actually just, I was with like another guy on Monday who was in a so, different kind of okay. conference, uh, and maybe, they actually uh, sent him like a package a in thought. a box, and it had yeah, like, okay. swag, like, and it had like a couple of snacks, hmm. and it was so that when you zoom <laughs> in, you could in. actually, okay, okay let's all get active. I think it's so great. I We've tried at a couple of different conferences to make shirts for the avatars so that you oh, could wear cool. swag or have yeah. a lanyard um but it's <laughs> like we keep running into platform issues and then right, right, right. then you gotta like train everyone on how to change their avatar and stuff but um but yeah it's pretty i think there's all kinds of those fun things that we'll be able to try to recapture what so it this, was like to be in person so this, like to be sure. stupid this isn't your first virtual like conference then this is kind of a thing now this, this is my is, first time and it's oh. <laughs> this is right. quickly too. becoming a thing oh sorry yes Catherine. sorry to uh, interrupt uh, i had a message from alex that said that we could uh, maybe we should start so aiden are you in agreement with that uh we have we are receiving conflicting information uh oh, okay. we might need to reset the world oh okay so Oops. thank you all for your patience <laughs> Uh, we all got here through a belly portal, and I'm going to offer that we all go back to presentation room B for a quick second.
Oh, oh God. God. Is hilarious. Yes. Yes. I see you now. <laughs> Where are you? That was cool. I'm behind you. I'm just chilling oh. behind you. Hi, Sarah. Here, hi. Hi. That's hilarious. Hi. So I guess the different kinds of portals work different ways, though, don't they? I don't think you can fall through. Uh, oh, let's not find out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I Alex. Where'd you go? Please let me know. Oh, hi, Beth. Like, no, no worries. Behind you. <laughs> I'm here, Andrew. I'm inside. Yeah. Uh, now we've got He's turning. Everything's a different yeah. color. And so should I rate this? <laughs> yes. Wow. There yeah. wasn't as many color choices. I thought. You know, I didn't need all of Okay, and oh, oh yeah, I know. <laughs> this is my first sure. question. Where are you Maybe you should have now? Okay. No, I didn't. Are you Also, I'm sorry, you were blind. Hello. Perfect. Do we know each other in the real world? Hello, tout le monde. Bonjour. Hello. Hi, everyone. Sorry. Hi. Hi, everyone. Hi. Is it sorry? Is David you? Hi, everyone. Sorry about that. Uh, that was entirely my fault. I I didn't do an Android build of the world, so everyone on a quest was unable to get in. And uh, I'm very sorry for you, Catherine. Um, but uh, I'd like to reintroduce and maybe let's get a round of applause for uh, Catherine Bourgeois speaking to us about her production, uh, Violette. Merci, Catherine, and uh, take it away. Thank you, <laughs> thank you. Um, can you hear me all right? Mm. Yeah. Yep, okay. Yep. Um, so thank you, Alex, and um, thank you for being here. Um, it's um, my first time uh, giving a talk in virtual reality and while sitting in the comfort of my home in Tochage, Montreal. Um, so I'm here as the artistic director of a company uh, called Joe, Jack and John. And um, we are like 17 years old, a theater company based in Montreal. And uh, our mandate focus on around collaboration and um, as well like uh, with a special, um, with a particular focus on collaborating with artists uh, living with disabilities. So we are like an inter interdependent um, company that uh, uh, love to create new shows and like uh, devise collectively um, um, together. Um, today I'm here to talk about Violet, which is our project that involves mixed reality, which is like live theater and uh, VR, like a VR film. Um, so this project started about like four years ago. Uh, the kind of like the like creation inception process started like four years ago. And initially I had in mind a site specific piece uh, that would then like get like an audience member to knock on a door and come in an apartment and meet one person. So that would have been like a one person at a time play um, and where like an, an actress uh, with a disability would open the door, welcome the spectator and make a cup of tea and share our story. And then I traveled to Europe and I, um, I was in a conference about like live arts and there was this uh, conference more about like mixed reality um, and augmented reality and virtual reality. And, and my only experience in that was that as a user, um, so I had very little to, um, I, I knew very little about it, but the, the conference person was like actually convinced that theater people uh, were actually good um, artists to help develop the lit literacy and the medium of uh, VR because we are used to kind of like uh, compose and write compelling story, engaging story, complex storytelling um, in actually immersive environment um, because like the theater experience being like a kind of like 360 immersive moment when you go to the theater. Um, so I came back to Montreal and I read more about the VR and I reflected and I felt really attracted to this new medium 
um, because I felt that it kind of like created a sense of connection that maybe photo, TV, mm -hmm. and film could create way back when it came out because there was this proximity and the novelty of the museum. But now, like this new museum that could create such a sensation was actually uh, VR. Um, at the same time, I was a bit like repulsed by the museum because um, <laughs> not because of the empathy feeling that it creates, but I just wonder if we needed uh, in our society like more um, more privileged people with high tech, expensive gears, um, developing a sense of entitlement around in the world of this ex kind of like oh yes, I know what is a refugee camp. I was there, I walked in the shoes of a refugee. Oh, I know what is Ebola crisis in Africa because I was there, I walked in those shoes. Um, so I guess that like convinced of the, uh, attracted by the museum and as well convinced of the importance of having more diverse voices, voices emerging, um, I kind of like jumped in and decided to uh, transform my site-specific theater project into like a mixed reality of like theater and VR. Um, so we started to work on a story that was anchored in a reality that we don't talk often or that we don't hear often about, which is the fact that 70 to 90 percent of women living with an intellectual disability will experience sexual abuse in the course of their lives. And um, um, so this is a, a difficult reality that like collaborating with artists with disability over the last 17 years, the company has been very kind of like, uh, it's a reality that we, we encountered in our lives. And so we gathered like a team of uh, differently abled artists and we started to devise on the subject. So Violet is actually like a story about intimacy, about consent and about abuse, abuse made by a family friend. Um, soon in the process of development of the script and all that, it became clear that we needed to do a beta version of it because actually like most of us being like theater maker, we had no clue what we were talking about. And it was very difficult to have meeting and to actually like see how it was it would be unfolding. So um, we did like a beta version at very low cost. It was shot in my own apartment in my bedroom. And uh, it was as well like presented. The theater uh, piece or the performance itself was as well presented in uh, my apartment in the spring of 2018 here in Montreal. So I'm just gonna present you like a short clip of uh, this kind of like first uh, beta version installment. Um, and it's like this version is in French and the sound is not that great, but it's basically the welcoming of a participant that arrives. So the live part of it, the more like theater part of it and going to like a quick excerpt of the 360 movie that we produced. Here we go. Participant that arrives. So the live part of it, the more. Okay.
Uh, okay, so actually, oh, I think there's some some going over. Um, Well, hi everybody. Um, so sorry for the technical difficulty. Um, my name is Yumi, I'm a colleague of Catherine. I also work for uh, Joe, Jack and John. Um, I guess that Catherine had a small connection issue so she has just disappeared but she should be back in a few seconds. Um, were you guys able to see the video or was it not showing for you? Not really. Yeah, no, I could see it. I can see it. I couldn't okay. see anything. I could see it. I kept it's saying it's just repeating. I could see two still screens. Too. Me. Yeah, it was two screens and the audio was really echoey and hard to make out. Oh, okay. Well, I'm really sorry about that. For those of you who could not see the screen, um, the video showed um, the actress Violet, um, Violet um, welcoming the spectator into an apartment and leading him to the bedroom where the interactive experience used to take place in the original beta version of the of the play. Um, so it was really a site specific experience, and that created a whole set of issues because we wanted to bring this work to uh, more people, you know, out in the world and have a tour and be able to reach as many people as we could with, with the story of, of Violet. Um, so from the very first uh, version that, uh, that, that was shown in the, um, in the video, we worked towards um, a second version um, that was not site specific anymore, even though it was shot in the same set. But um, the video itself shows a bedroom and the, the experience takes place in a very similar setting. However, the interactive experience uh, takes place in a custom built cabin that is um, half the size of the real VR space. So that when the spectator arrives to take part into the experience, it finds themselves in this like tiny cabin that is that gives this kind of feeling of um, intrusion and a, it's a little bit claustrophobic and you feel really uncomfortable because you're really entering a personal and private space of Violet and you're about to hear her very personal and private story. Um, so it was really important for us to find a way to keep um, a connection between the real physical space and the virtual world space. So the what we let's say that we use a couple of tricks to uh, to try to ensure continuity in the space perception. So one is that the um, the accessories and the furniture that are in the cabin are exactly the same ones that you see in the virtual world. Uh, it's just the dimensions are a little bit different. Um, and another one is that we used uh, a blanket that is given to the audience member when it arrives on the set um, that he puts or she puts on herself. And then in the virtual world, you you enter the experience sitting on a bed with the same blanket on you that you can see. So it gives you the impression that that is still you yourself, your f physical self in the virtual world with the same accessories around you. And you I mean? think I saw Catherine, uh, yeah, so yeah, I'm, I'm going to let her continue. So I guess you were covering mother anchoring the participant in the and the reality. Um, mm -hmm. 
Um, some of the challenge, um, I'm sorry, I disappeared. I was exposed from the States, but I'm back. Um, so some of the challenge that um, uh, I faced and I discovered through that first incarnation was actually the, the fact of directing actors when there's a 360 camera in a space where like I can't be in the space and I still have to direct and get the kind of like get this to see what the look what it looks like so that was one of the challenges that we faced and as well I think that one of the um finding that we had was that like the importance of like other characters because if it's only one character talking there's a very like there's a very minimal use of the actual like 360 environment while if there's like interaction with different character in the space there's a possibility for like using more like the 360 element of it and in the kind of like golden version that we produced after that we even like pushed it further in the sense that we we in put more emphasis on the creating like an interaction with the audience member and getting the audience member to become more like a participating kind of role in it, like as a witness, but as well as a friend, as a confiding friend. So um, I think that that's about like that, what we learned from that. And I would like to just like, if for you it was possible to follow me on the second platform over there, I'd like to show you like an excerpt of like the golden version, the golden version that like we produced uh, last year. So teleportation. Okay, but I can talk, I can, I'm starting with the, the other screen. So do you want to do that while I do the, the, the video screen? Do, you're going to do slides? No, I'm, I'm finishing with the slides. Okay, yes, but this is the one I'm going to switch to. Oh, okay. okay. One second. You, you can start, uh, go ahead. Nice work, Catherine. <laughs> hi Clayton, hi. Oh my god. I'm sweaty. <laughs> <laughs> I know I have eye sweat. <laughs> um so uh while Alex is rebuilding, I think we kind of like gathered but um so Alex is gonna rebuild the projection screen. Um but I just gonna keep uh chatting away. Um I guess like because of the subject matter being such a difficult um, one, uh, we chose to actually like uh, not develop like a graphic express, I mean a graphic work, but more like a magic realistic, magic realism way of doing the story, of unfolding the story. So, and in the golden version, we also decided to push further the confinement in the room um, and not using like footage like of external elements. Have you seen downstairs with the beta version where we kind of like put like the impression of like a layer of forest of actual forest in the room, but we just developed more like the magical aspect in a more like imaginative way. And um, and the screen's still not there. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, um, I guess that like uh, the production, I could tell you that the production was meant to open in Montreal last May, but uh, obviously because of COVID, it was postponed and we uh, thought that we would be able to open it this October, this late October. But um, um, as you might know, um, the COVID crisis in Montreal is like, we are about like 1100 new cases a day. Uh, so mm. we don't think that we're gonna be able to present the production uh, this fall. Um, so we just like keeping a uh, finger crossed that one day we'll be able to actually present the full experience um, with the live interaction and the VR element to it. Um, we were in touch with the Phi Center in Montreal and they advised us to buy a clean box. So I don't know if any of you had to deal with like COVID issue, COVID related issue, but we um, but like a clean box uh, from the States and it's basically like a UV, UV 
uh, rays that kind of kill everything. So between each participant, we'll we'll have to put the um, the headset in the clean box. Um, Alex, where are you? Ah. Oh, ready. Blue roses are actually white roses. You cut them and put them in blue coloring. In a few hours, they turn blue. Stay here. I've never liked it here. It's really depressing. You think so? You should come with me to the forest. You can breathe there. Be free. No. Not now, okay? You must feel so alone when I'm not there. I'm not alone. Look, someone's here. It's cramped. Stuffy. You'd be better off with me in the forest. There are people who come and see me. People like who? Look, I have company. People like him, Violet. Him who? People like Joe. Joe will always be grateful to us. Joe fills our house with flowers of all colors, balloons, teddy bears, and thank you cards that play music. Joe sends me a blue rose every 4th of March to thank me for saving his life. Joe speaks French. He dresses well, and he's a really good guy. Joe buys me a slinky red dress for my 16th birthday. Joe comes to see me one evening when my parents are at the movies. Joe shows me a movie that I don't know how I feel. Joe invites me for a picnic. Joe puts his hand somewhere, but I'm not too sure. For my 18th birthday, Joe tells me about an even more special flower. Joe says that at 18, we can. At 18, we can. Joe is a magician. His best trick, disappearing from my life.
So, yeah, that was the <laughs> um, excerpt. So, opening it won't be October 28th, but um, soon, soon it will happen. Um, so, as I said, like in the little notes uh, through the videos, I guess that like what I wanted to stretch by um, that is that like as theater makers, uh, we have some tools or skills that we develop, uh, which uh, is, I guess, the power of words, um, acting, the transitioning as well. And so um, instead of like just relying on more like pricey and special effects and things that maybe were a bit outside of our um, um, reach, we actually like use the, the things that we were good at. And, uh, and one thing that we rely all the way in theater is the suspension of disbelief because nobody like, like you go to the theater and nobody believes that there, this is real stuff happening. There's wings, there's other people around, there's like uh, all kind of element that tells you that this is not real life. Well, sometimes in movie, we do get this impression of real life happening. Uh, so like we, kind of like if we point out and say this is a forest and although it's like a shadow theater forest like we rely on the fact that people will believe it is a forest so um we use that a lot because basically uh, we really stayed way more in the room in that version than in the f previous version and we try to kind of like push the imagin imaginative uh, aspect of it um I'm just going to move to the slide section, which I can move maybe... to, uh, Catherine, I can move it to you. I can move it to you. Oh, okay. Um, I, I would also say we're, we are a bit short on time and it's, yeah. it's entirely my fault. Do you, do you want to maybe take questions from the audience, like to give them a chance to, to ask you, but the first, um, do you want to go through the slides? Oh, I just like, just, I would like to finish just like as in terms of like, um, um, if you could, Put up the slides i will just we'll use do. one slide or two um just quickly to finish i guess that like the first version was shot in my bedroom and as you can imagine i didn't want to go with a full production shot in um oops here we are uh shot in um my bedroom with the hundreds of audience member going through my apartment so we did build a set um we paired up with a very fine company here in montreal it's named unlimited and um this is the company uh, and quickly we as well shot the thing with three different actresses so we could actually present it three different times so this Anne Steffi that you've seen in the English excerpt and there's as well Stephanie that's doing another French version and Tamara who's the bilingual and plays both uh, both version um, this is us cutting wood in the forest and this is actually the set we built. So it's a box set that was meant to be like a, a closed room. So this bridge between the... Oh no, it looks like we lost Catherine again. So sorry about that. So um, what you're seeing right now, um, Natan left is the actual set where the cabin where the experience takes place um, and as you can see the the bed and the chair are the exactly same and the the pictures on the wall are the exact same elements that are in the VR video when you're in experiencing the VR parts of the story so uh, just to conclude I'm back. we uh, okay. I'm, I'm yeah, back so wanna... thank you Yumi so <laughs> So that was our way of making a terrible set that would like bridge between the reality and the fiction and bridge the two worlds together. And um, maybe we have time for a few questions, but as well, I just wanted to let you know that if any of you would be interested to see the full version, we now have it on YouTube VR and you can contact, or you can talk to me or I about it and we could send you the link. And uh, Alex, if there's time for one question or two, like I'll let you decide. <laughs> Of course, yeah. Uh, anyone have a question and want to raise their hand? Um, we can. <laughs> We're good. Uh, all right. Thanks so much oh, for yes. creating that, Catherine. I think that was beautiful, yeah. by the way. Amy, Amy, uh, one one question over here. Amy Bouchard. Yeah. Hi, Catherine. Um, 
Yeah, I'm just curious about um, the audience coming in to experience the show. Um, I'm not sure if you can hear me. Do you yeah. find that you have um, audiences who are also coming in on the spectrum or neurodiverse who are taking part in the work as well? This is like the the, um, the question of accessibility is very close to our heart, obviously, like the accessibility as an audience member as well. So uh, we are developing um, kind of like groups of people, of women most, uh, mostly living with a disability and uh, doing a workshop, a prepping workshop and like just some special um, um, session for them to actually come in. So this is something that we are working on in terms of like making sure that this work reach an audience that's actually concerned about it. Um, so I would say yes, this is like actually like a quite accessible work. It's not like uh, art to access. The story unfolds very kind of like smoothly and accessibly, I would say. Thanks for Wonderful. your question. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, we are unfortunately at time. If you have other questions for, for uh, Catherine, uh, please uh, maybe go find her and, and, uh, and, and ask her one on one. And Catherine, I just want to thank you. That was, I, I, I mean, that's the equivalent of, you know, the theater while we're doing the show, the, you know, faucets explode and the place floods, but we just keep going. We keep doing it. And you were brilliant. You were absolutely fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you for, and sorry about all that. Thank you. No, it's, no, you, you were amazing. Thank you so much. So yeah. we're uh, moving on to our, our next, uh, uh, we have uh, Beth Kate's workshop. And if you want to, Check out Darren O'Donnell's uh, uh, presentation. That is on Zoom. You can find the link in Discord. Um, and uh, yes, thank you again, Catherine. My pleasure. Thanks to you. Entends-tu la forêt respirer? Je sais pas pourquoi commence toujours mon histoire ici. Peut-être juste parce que ça énerve les gens, ou parce qu'il y a tellement de contes qui commencent dans les bois.
Hi, welcome everybody. Welcome. Sorry that it's over here and as opposed to into the alt space, but it, my go was just not stable enough. It was really glitchy and I was quite concerned about it crash. Oh, it crashes too every now and again. So um, often I just disappear from a space. Um, I'm talking to my friends and poop, I'm gone. So, <laughs> so yeah, uh, maybe next year I'll have a quest. Um, uh, I'm trying to, I'm making Logan a co-host. Uh, okay. Oh yeah, you're the live streamer. Hey, Logan. Um, Howard is just arriving. Um, so uh, where is everybody located? Anybody in any place? We've got a couple Germans in the house. Jana Eiting and Christopher. Hi. Uh, Rojo. Oh. 10 p.m. 10 p.m. in Germany, 6 a.m. Who's making the bigger sacrifice, 6 a.m. or 10 p.m.? It's up 6 to you. 6 a.m. Always morning. <laughs> Always morning. <laughs> I actually feel quite the opposite. I don't like staying up late. I, I prefer really? getting up early. Yeah, yeah. I'm an early no, the only time I like being early is when I'm still up late. <laughs> <laughs> no, I agree. I agree. Uh, um, <laughs> that's, I, I find that gross. Uh, and, uh, well, the way it goes. Uh, sorry, I'm double checking around here. We still got about eight, five more minutes before okay. we're supposed to start. So okay. I'm going to go do another call in our virtual conference room and we'll be back. <clears throat> okay, great. Um, so we, Deb, Lim, where are you located? Um, I'm in Toronto. Okay, great. Yeah. Where, where, what's, give me an intersection. Um, I, I'm here with uh, Fujian Theater. Okay. I, I, I meant can see you in April. Well, but where are you, but your actual geolocation, like what's your close, what's your closest intersection? I don't know. Just Oh, where? I'm, uh, I am currently located in Chinatown, Siskadina and Dundas. Okay, great. And that's where your home is or, you know, that's office? where my home is. Yeah. Okay. All right. Nice. How's the weather? Um, I haven't gone out, <laughs> right. um, but Fall weather, it's nice. It's been okay. nice. Uh, yeah. Okay. All right, great. How is Fujin doing? Uh, we're doing pretty well. Um, we've been working from home for since March. Right. Um, but but what's, doing well. What's your plan for the pandemic? Um, we've been doing a lot of like, uh, just like, uh, commission work and development. Uh, not uh, only very few like presentation and on very small scales online. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's brutal. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> it's been very un non the opposite of fun, whatever that is. Um, <laughs> brutal. Um, who's who's the what's your role there? Um, I my title is administrator. Um, I work with uh, David Yi, and it's. Uh, Kind of just the two of us with an intern so okay. i really just do it all right 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 okay cool yeah it's been at mammalian we're just sort of kind of treading water a tiny bit with luckily we had a project that was able to go ahead and that's what i'm talking about in in germany at a very reduced sort of scale as i'll as i'll cover um, but yeah, it's been not very pleasant. And, and also just this question of, should I be thinking about solving this in a major way? Or should we just like, just, you know, plug our noses and hope we survive and then we get to the other side, you know, that's a big question for me. I don't want to, I don't want to invest too many resources in pivoting when, when I'm not interested so much in the digital kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So that's, it's an interesting, it's a challenging question for me. Yeah. Yeah, the thing that I think about is that theater for me is there's three things about it, which is I, I do it to or I go I attend work to leave the house or I attend work and I attend work to hang out with other people. And then the th sort of the third one third of my desire is to actually see the work. So there's two thirds and without those two thirds checking out even other people's stuff online is I just don't I'm not motivated, although the the um, the, the alt space VR that's been I are you enjoying that by any chance like do you find th that you're you're there with people and that feels good in a in a kind of meaningful way um 
I don't know. I think that's a it's a it's something that we're still navigating very much so um because it feels like as much as we're trying to do collaborative things it's almost like you're working on your own unit you know right um and and there may be some collaboration but it's it's really challenging so i i'm not i'm not too sure yet right yeah yeah for sure um, I don't know Tian. I don't know what your practice all or who you are. So I can you I who you how what are you doing? <laughs> well, who are you and what are you doing here? <laughs> oh my god! I did not expect to get the uh, interrogated. <laughs> um, I'm on I'm on Toaster Labs advisory board. Ah, and, okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, and I'm in media arts. So I'm actually one of the few non theater practitioners. Okay, great. Here, um, I teach media arts with. Uh, well, I'm at York with Ian Garrett. Okay, okay, cool. Okay, well, great. Thanks for coming. That's good to know. Um, and anybody else want to say hi? Jason, I've never met you, I don't think. You don't look familiar to me. I'm Darren. No, I, no we have not met. Hi, yes, I am Jason. I'm also a non-theater person, uh, okay, cool. but uh, came came into VR at from, from the filmmaking angle, but I always okay. felt right from the beginning that, this, that VR is more... VR is more akin to theater than filmmaking, in in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, I know that, that really yeah. came apparent to me when I started hearing directors saying things like, "Yeah, but the problem with 360 video is you can't direct the audience." I'm like, that that right. kind of sounds like a problem <laughs> theater directors have not worried about for a thousand years. Like, it yeah. doesn't sound like a problem, you know. Yeah, so, uh, so I started looking more toward theater, and you know, a lot of my friends are theater folk, but I've just not had the experience myself. So. Right. Uh, so I feel like I'm learning about theater through VR, actually, kind of going the opposite way. Oh, wow. Okay, that's interesting. Okay, mm -hmm. cool. All right. All right, thanks. Um, who else do I, do I not know? Madison, um, do you want to in introduce yourself, a little bit about the, what you're up to, if you're there? Hi. Hi, how are you doing? I'm good. Yourself? <laughs> yeah, yeah, good, good. Thanks for coming. Um, just meeting somebody. What? Um, what um, yeah, so what's, what's your interest in this, or what's, what's your practice, or how, what brought you to the conference? Um, so I was introduced to the whole uh, PXR thing from uh, Ian Garrett. He was one of my profs at uh, York. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I graduated York uh, last year, and I... I got to my Apple Care on the last day it was a thing. <laughs> <laughs> and it's on the Mac. It worked now. Yes. Maybe we can, who's, oh yeah, anyway, okay, sorry, go ahead, Madison. Um, apart from that, I've been, um, well, since graduating, I was working with Canada's Valley Oregon as their lighting director okay. until the pandemic happened. It's funny because literally town after town, it felt like everything was shutting down as we right. were moving. Right. Um, apart from that, uh, it's mainly lighting and media design that I'm interested in. And okay. um, as far as XR, I mean, when I was in high school, I learned a bit about the U Unity engine. Um, slowly, I've been interested more in Unreal Engine, mainly because um, of how they have the Unreal Marketplace and they do the uh, free items for the month. And that's just a lot of assets available to creators. Okay. For a lot of, um, uh, yeah, it's a lot of assets that a creator can use to build an environment. Um, I'm interested in a lot in that and uh, Blender, and eventually I want to create my own stuff, but never really had time until now. All of those words are, are, have next to no meaning for me. Um, <laughs> Fair they enough. Have meaning for me, but <laughs> <laughs> they have meaning for you, Chris. Yeah. Okay, that's Chris Rahol, who's um, one of the performers in the project that I'm about to introduce, and he's beaming in from Germany. Um, oh. Yeah. So th thanks everybody for coming here. I'm just, I mean, as before we start, I'm just asking a few people who I don't know, just introduce themselves. I see somebody that I don't know, Rinchen Dolma. Um, do you want to say hi and, and just introduce yourself to, to whatever extent you feel like it? Uh, hi, it's, I'm, hi. I'm sorry I'm late. I, I got um, a little lost. <laughs> oh. <laughs> no worries, um, no worries. Um, hi folks, I'm, I'm from uh, Toronto and I'm with Peter Pasmarai. Okay. Um, yeah. So I'm just um, I'm happy to be here. Thanks for letting me uh, introduce myself. Yeah. Thanks for coming. I appreciate it. 
Um, so should we roll this, Aiden, do you think? Or yeah, yeah, let's time? get the boat going. Okay, great. All right, I just need to do my little preamble. So oh, thank yeah, you course. all for making it and pivoting with us in this technological adventure that we are calling PXR 2020. I am Aiden Hammond, I am the project manager, and I'm so glad that we are all here together. PXR 2020 is brought to you by Single Thread Theatre Company and Electric Company Theatre, with thanks to our community partners, Toaster Lab and Langara Centre for Entertainment Arts, and with the spending support of Canada Council for the Arts's, Arts's? Canada Council for the Arts Digital Strategies Fund. I would like to acknowledge that I am reporting to you live from the stolen and unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples, Musqueam, the Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh. Uh, and I see that we're coming in from all over, so I want you on this Thanksgiving weekend to respect where you are and how privileged we are to be here sharing this moment with the technology we have here today. Please, Darren, you know more about this than I do. I am so <laughs> excited to hear what you have to bring to us. Okay, cool, thanks a lot. Um, so I'm going to share a screen and get this rolling. Um, there we go, make sure I have my clicker. Yeah, okay, so great. I obvi obviously also wanna thank um, everybody that, uh, that uh, Aiden thanked and thank Aiden, Alex and uh, Liam from, from Single Thread, Clayton from Electric Company um, for providing all of the support that they've been providing and as well, um, I'm setting all of this up, it's all very confusing to me. Um, also wanted to acknowledge Canon Hewitt who is in the room with us. Um, Canon is helping with the tech stuff and is also a producer with Mammalian on, on this project and is part of the team that managed to get our video running and all the goggles through the VR sync. So maybe there might be some questions for Canon um, after this. Um, so our project, uh, Mammalian Diving Reflexes project, The Last Minutes Before Mars, we just um, premiered on the 25th of September in Bochum, Germany. And it was presented by Schauspielhaus Bochum and co-commissioned by the Milano Trinale and Zona K in Milano. I would, protect, I, would, I would encourage you to check out Zona K. They're a really interesting um, uh, organization that punches well above their weight in Milan. It's a project space. They're super cool. Milano Triennale is cool, but it's big and everybody knows it. But Zona K, if you're, if you're curious about cool stuff going on there. So first up, I want to introduce um, the co-director of the project, Jana Eiting. That's her picture. She's also in the room with us. Uh, and she's, she was on the ground directing in Germany while I directed via Zoom this project in, from Australia, which was a fucking nightmare. Um, and uh, she also directed all of the 360 video bits that we used. And I've been working with her since 2011 um, on a variety of projects. That's a project we worked on with refugees. And then there she is getting her hair cut by kids. Um, and so I also want to introduce uh, Christopher Rockel, who is also in, in Zoom with us, and he is um, one of the member of Mit Ona Alice, which is a collective of young people that we've been working with since 2012 in Germany, um, when he was 12 years old, and there he is, Christopher Rockel at age 12. Look at how, look at how cute he is. Um, and he's still cute. Um, was, he's now becoming ah. more handsome than cute. Uh, and so, um, so that's him. And um, so I've been working with him since he was 12, Yana since she was 24, and I was 47 at that time. Obviously, we're all a lot older, especially me. Um, mm -hmm. So Mammalian started to work in the region um, to, with the Children's Choice Awards at the Rutrinel Festival. So this is a, a project where you take a bunch of kids and we see all of the shows in a given festival and then we give out awards um, at the end. And so we did that for three years uh, with young people in the region. And, um, and, and then since that time, we've worked with the same group of young people uh, from the, basically from the first year. We worked with them, of course, it's winnowed down, but we've worked with those guys since that time. We've done a project, at least one project a year over the course of the last bunch of years. Um, and um, in, in 2014, we posed to them the question of what they wanted to do next. And that was just when the situation with the refugees coming to Europe was starting to heat up. And they all said, they, first they, they framed it in terms of working with marginalized people. That was kind of the language that, that they were using at that time. Um, there, I'm just gonna expand it. So they were using that sort of language and then we evolved that and continued to discuss what that might look like. And then um, we, we decided to work with youth who were new to the country, particularly interested in finding a population who was, uh, who, where there were representatives from 
the, the refugee crisis that was happening then with, with particularly it was with Syria at the time, but there were people coming from all over the place. So we created this project called Millionen, Millionen, Millionen. Um, that title comes from the Schiller quote from the, the anthem of Europe, which is Ode to Joy. And the quote is Zeid und Schlungen Millionen, which means be embraced, you millions. And so the, the leitmotif or the theme of the festival was Zeid und Schlungen, and um, Millionen, I'm just going to admit somebody in here, okay, um, Millionen uh, was, was the, the second line, be embraced you millions, so this, this show was really, the, the theme of the festival was Zeit und Schlungen, and, and, or the tagline, and we named our, fest, our actual show Millionen, as in millions, millions, millions of, um, of the people to be embraced. Um, and so what we did for the project is we took um, a bunch of German-born teens and about 40, and there was about well, maybe 20 of those, and then 20 um, teens from, um, who had come uh, to the region fairly recently, refugees, immigrants to the region very recently, and we took them all camping. And we did what you do in camping, we played games, we made crowns for our hair, uh, we climbed in trees, we climbed on piles of dirt, um, we pet, uh, you know, pet horses, we played chess, um, we went canoeing, um, and then what we did was we created a show that basically reported on it, what happened over the course of these, these camping trips. We went on three camping trips over the course of three weekends. Um, and, uh, and if you take 40 teens from Germany, Syria, Albania, Gambia, and Poland, among other places, if you take all those guys camping, trust me, lots of shit happens. So we just basically reported on this is what happens when you take these two groups together um, and, and we all, this is what happens. Um, and so at that point, Mit Ona Alice, the collective that was originally mostly German born um, young people that we've been working with expanded to include a bunch of these other guys. Two of these other guys are in this uh, project uh, and that we're, I'm uh, introducing now. And so, sorry, here's, here's some more from Million and Million and Million. And we had iPads where we looked at all the photographs. You can see the photographs there and the younger, young people are controlling them through iPads. And we just talked about what we, what we did there. The, the, the disco ball is representing the fire that we used to go around and the marshmallows, we roasted the marshmallows on a disco ball. Um, so, um, and here you can see that's, um, that's Pascal in the middle, and he's been with Matona Alice since the beginning, and that's Robert on the right, and they're both in, in the Mars project, um, and they're now, um, you can see here, <laughs> I love these two pictures, they're older, they're, they're now eight, eight years older than they were then, and they look like they've <laughs> lived, <laughs> they've lived some, they lived, they've had some, some times that they've lived through, and they have, but this is, this is, these are stills from the 360 video, so they're acting there too, just uh, FYI. So the last minutes before Mars is a mixed reality project that combines live performance with 360 video. Um, first, I'm gonna take you through the show as the audience experiences it. Um, and then I'm gonna go through a bit of the development process and the making of, I'll share, I'll share some stills from the 360 video, but you can watch them themselves in their 360 form through the YouTube links that I've got in the Discord. Um, so if you wanna check that out, or if you don't have access to that, just let me know and I can share the YouTube link so that you can see them in their 360. Um, now, at this point, I'll just describe the show from the audience perspective so you can have a sense of the experience. Um, and I've got some photos of it. I've also got some drawings by the Montreal's Sorsha, Gib Sorsha Gibson, who is the designer on the project. Um, and just the, the show is conceived to accommodate as many audience members as the budget will allow for, for VR goggles. However, th with the premiere, we only could fit um, 12 people in this uh, due to COVID. So we had eight performers and 12 audience members, which was obviously ridiculous, but that's what, I mean, we're lucky to get that happening at all. So, so you can see there when the audience uh, enters, uh, you sit on either side of what appears to be a cube in the center of the room. There, there are a few people in the cube seen through the translucent dividers that are keeping you, uh, that are creating the cube. Um, and, and there's three performers walking around the cube. There's beautiful, mysterious music playing. There's fog in the air. And basically the, the performers first guide you through putting the goggles on and you test them with an image of the room um, and that you're, you're in. So you, when you first put on the goggles, you're in the same room, but it's empty. There's no set, there's no lights, there's nothing. And you spin around and you look, you're guided so that you can you know, start to feel what it's like to operate the, the, the goggles. Then they, they basically take you through, through some meditations and visualizations uh, asking you uh, to imagine your own bathroom. That's where it sort of ends up is that you're, you're, you're asked to, to imagine your own bathroom and, 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 and go through 
think about what has happened to you in that particular room and that particular room as a very, very ordinary room, a room that you're in almost every day of your life. If you're at home, certainly every day of your life, if you're at home and, and all of the trials and tribulations that you've had there, all the good times you've had there with warm baths and lovely poops. And then obviously the bad times you've had there when you're in you know, whatever, you're, you're sick or you're stressed out about something or it's five in the morning and you're, you've been up all night doing cocaine and you're thinking you've fucked up your life so badly by your cho life choices. So, so, but this room is a very special room. And, and, and just the fact is that one day, whether you go to Mars or not, you will never see that room again which starts to introduce some of the themes that are related in the related to, to, I guess, Stoicism and Buddhism are two of the places we're drawing some of these ideas um, and impermanence. So then they ask you to don the goggles. And whenever you enter the goggles, again, you first see the room that you're in um, and, uh, and the, this, this space without, without the set, and then these series of videos. And the first video you see is, um, is the, 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 these five youth who are, astronauts, you learn that they're astronauts that have been selected to go to Mars, uh, to colonize Mars in the face of an ex existential threat of a speeding meteor that's coming to Earth, which may or may not be fake news, and you, and you hear them receive their last assignment. So 48 hours before liftoff, they're, they're asked to create a 360 archive of their most beautiful but ordinary uh, places on Earth. And over the course of the show, the audience is in and out of the goggles as they spend time with these guys uh, over the last, their last minutes on Earth in some of their favorite spots. You know, their homes, uh, there's Chris at his favorite uh, comic uh, store. Uh, there's uh, Robert with his brother in a park that, that, they, that they hang out in. Um, there's Lynn hanging out with her family. I think Lynn may be in the room right, in Zoom right now, if you are high. And there's Lynn, her grandmother's to the left there in the family. There's Iska with her sister. And, and we, we encourage them at times to actually acknowledge the camera because the fictional conceit is that they're creating this for themselves to look at when they're on Mars um, and they're feeling lonely, they can look back and relive, relive it. So it's, it's sort of, it's their POV. The, the video is the POV of the astronaut in the future. Um, and so um, just, just some technical stuff, time spent in the goggles is roughly six minutes per session in the goggles uh, for a total of 30 minutes. Uh, of 360 video, so five sessions in the goggles with a couple sessions that are a little bit shorter. Um, and then there's 40 minutes of live performance. So that's about a 70 minute experience. Um, some of the 360 sequences are just with the sound that was recorded uh, during the shoot. Some are accompanied by a live voiceover provided by the performers. And the performers are providing this live voiceover um, from an area on the set, that, that's a, that mission control area. So there's the mission control and and that's they're they're performing it there, and 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 some of the videos are also supported by music, which is also played by the cast using a Roland sampler, and that's Emma using the sampler there, learning how to use it, um, and uh, that's located in this mission control. There's Lynn with the sampler in front of her. She also played the sampler or activated it, I guess. So they're performing. A, they're, the youth are providing a performers are providing a live scoring by switching between different tracks on a given piece of music, which com was composed by. Uh, a couple friends of mine in Hamburg called Isola. Isola Music is the company. Um, every time the performers take off the goggles, um, or every time the performers are in the goggles watching the video, not the performers, I'm sorry, the audience is in the goggles watching the video, the performers surreptitiously are moving these dividers around um, so, that, so that every time you take off the goggles as the audience member, you are suddenly in a different space. I want that feeling. And for me, that capitalizes on, on what I think is the, is the most interesting part for me, or the weirdest part of a VR 360, is for me, it's the moment when you take them off. That's the most the, uh, alarming to me. And, and it, there's almost a sort of, sort of dystopian feeling as you return back to reality. I, when I first got my go, I was playing this fishing game for literally two hours, but I started it when the sun was up, streaming into my room. And then over the course of playing the game, the sun went down and when I took it off, it was the street light coming in and the socks that I had strewn around my room were just sort of glowing and, and just, and I, and I just was like, it felt really dystopian that when you come back to reality, reality feels like the wrong place that you're in and, 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 and the VR world is so much more beautiful. So I really wanted to capture that sort of dystopian aspect of returning back to this place that is kind of not recognizable because you've been away for it for so long is sort of what it feels like. Um, so, so that you can see there that how the, the, the partitions get moved into different configurations. Um, and so when, when the audience is outside of the goggles, they're guided through a series of meditations and visualizations where they're asked to imagine in detail a beautiful ordinary day. 
And, and then they are later then asked to share that beautiful ordinary day that they've imagined in detail with another audience member. And then even later in the show, they're asked to share what they've heard of one the other audience member to yet a, a third party. So you share it, you hear somebody's, then you share the what you've heard to, to, to somebody else. And um, you can see there you, the little sharing session, sessions, a little bit challenging with the COVID restrictions, but we had these sections. And so over the course of the show, you're, you're meeting other people who are, you, who you're supposed to think of sort of as potentially the, your, the people that you will be spending the rest of your life with on Mars if you were one of the astronauts. Um, and so finally, they're asked to, the audience is asked to combine all of their beautiful ordinary days into a beautiful ordinary day object. They're asked to imagine to hold out their hands and beam all of these beautiful ordinary days, these banal days that are, that are beautiful because of their banality into their hands. Um, and, and, um, and at one point as that, as that happens, and they visualize this organic object that represents this, um, then we have this party sequence where we basically claim to steal them all back. The astronauts take them back and, um, and claim that the, these objects will now be planted on Mars so that generations from now, the Mars colonizers might have a chance to have their own beautiful ordinary days, which probably won't happen for a while on Mars. Um, also, throughout this plot line, there are a series of ethical questions that are posed to the audience um, during the meditation sort of beautiful days plot line, there's also these ethical questions, questions about the future of humanity, whether humanity has the right to colonize other planets like that, questions like that, whether we should send a diverse crew to Mars to save humanity that includes disabled people, or should they be our so-called brightest and best people that we send to Mars? Um, I call these questions the Thunberg questions after Greta. Um, and finally, there's also another plot where where when you don the goggles and you return, when you're into the space, the empty space that I mentioned, there's over the course of seeing, being in the goggles, suddenly within that space, there are three of the astronauts who, who are entering that space and they, 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 they come up to you and they, um, in, in the VR goggles and they, they claim that they have them, they've got them, they've got your things, they've got them, they, don't, they, they didn't manage to take them. And maybe that's not so clear what's happening, but they are holding the box, which you maybe recognize as the, as the beautiful ordinary day object box. And then eventually at the end of the show, they enter the space in real life um, and grab you and take you outside. And then out, outside you're returned the, um, the beautiful, the given the beautiful ordinary day objects, which are these, um, they're called roses of Jericho. They're little, or little plants that if you add, a, they look dead, but if you add some water, they spring back to life. So they give those back to you and say, you must take them, take them, take them. We didn't, we, and it's clear that these guys have abandoned the mission and you've learned that, that, that there's been some people who've abandoned the mission and that these people are now being hunted and they're, 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 they're you know, persona non grata. And then what they spray fuck Mars on the side of the theater, you can see them, the objects are in, in the foreground there that an audience member is taking them back. So they, they spray fuck Mars, then a cop car screams up uh, and this cop jumps out and, and screams at everybody that they must leave. The, I have asked the, I asked the cop to play it as if he was scared, as if as if his life was at risk by these people get, getting here and the youth run off and and he screams off with his car again and the audience is left sort of by themselves uh, to to deal with the show. So the end. So that's that's the show. Um, so now I just want to go through the conception of the show and, and take you through behind the scenes and how we worked in particular with the youth. Um, so the, the, the project was first conceived as the final project in an umbrella project called Teen Talitarianism. And Teen Talitarianism is a, is a festival within a festival of work uh, that is created by and collaborated with teens for an adult audience that happens over the course of a festival. And the last project within Teen Talitarianism is called Ask for the Moon. And Ask for the Moon is uh, a project that features the teens that we've been working with usually over the course of a month, say, um, and, and asks them to present a set of demands to the, the festival, to Mammalian as a, as a collaborator in the festival and any other stakeholders that are there. Um, and we, we, we ask them to, to give us a set of demands about how they wanna to continue to work with us in the future. And in front of an audience, we negotiate with the teens uh, about what might be possible in the future. And they'll, they'll do things like, for example, the Milan teens, one of their first things was that they wanted to Skype with, um, with the mammalian team. They wanted to Skype with us once a week. <laughs> and I assured them that they do not want to get on Skype once a week. Trust me, it might sound like a good idea now, but, and we agreed to Skype once a month. Um, and so we did that for a bunch of months after. And this project came out of it and it was, they wanted to do a project about uh, interplanetary space travel. 
so that was that was the that was the first that was the first idea. So then that evolved into oops, a little premature. That that evolved into to wanting to do a project where 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 the, we would create a stage based work in which a team of young people would basically share what they were doing at almost every moment of the day during a predetermined period. So the idea was that they would carefully document a two week two week period of their lives. I was thinking during the summer, you know, when things are chilled a bit, and basically get on stage and share this. So I, I wanted to, and go hour by hour describing a two week period in the life of a teenager. And I wanted to capture sort of that excruciatingly bored, but still sort of luxurious feeling of, of being bored in the middle of summer and, and not having anything to do and what that feels like. And, and Mars in this case was understood to be what was happening elsewhere. It was a bit of a FOMO kind of uh, metaphor that, that there's this assumption that all these great things and exciting things are happening elsewhere. And that, that's what Instagram, you know, all of that sort of shit, that way that that throws up all of that. And, and, but yet your, your ordinary life is just quite dull, except I wanted to really look at the beautiful of that, the beautiful aspects of that. So, um, so what we did first was we uh, did a test of this with the Milano teens to got, we all basically got them, got them to fill out this survey on Google Docs, which we made a survey for each of them that had all of the times for a 72 hour period, every hour, we got them to fill this out. And myself and the producer, um, Alice Fleming also did this. Um, so you can see there, yeah, it's a basic mindfulness survey. Where are you? Describe where you are. What do you hear? What are you doing? Who are you with? How do you feel? What are you annoyed about? What would you change? What are you grateful for? So a little bit of a, a mindfulness kind of survey. And then you can see at the bottom, there's the, um, that's the line that then was developed for the script. Um, and you can see that's 4 p.m. We've got that happening, or that's Alba. Uh, that's what Alba was experiencing. Then at 5 p.m., this is, <laughs> she's in the same place. Now she's listening to BTS and she's, she's, um, she's got her new uh, $40, 40, 40 euro earbuds. She's tired, doesn't know what she cooks for dinner. So what we did was we took, so 72 hours uh, of this times six performers, turned that into a script and then flew them up on stage and for a little workshop presentation of going year by year, or sorry, not year by year, uh, hour by hour um, through their lives. It was interesting. Uh, I, I have to say that it was, and, and it might appeal to some, a certain kind of audience that really likes sort of high concept kind of stuff, but ultimately it was kind of boring, I got to say. Um, so that's when we decided to make the, the decision to film it. And this idea of the beautiful ordinary day archive started to develop. And we approached Konstantin Bach, who's a filmmaker we work with. He suggested we do it in 360, um, 360 uh, video. So we prepared that by interviewing all of the youth about their favorite spots. Um, and there's the Duomo in Milano, where we did, that's obviously some filming we did there. So we, we interviewed them all on WhatsApp, talked to them about the project, uh, their favorite spots. And then, and then um, we shot that, a uh, bunch of footage in Milan in October of 2019 with the Milan youth. We we're supposed to keep on developing that, but of course COVID came. Now, our approach to the 360 video was again, ordinary places just sort of ordinary places that they would miss on mars not fantastic roller coasters or swimming with sharks which is often what the 360 video is about we wanted to look at the the really the the, the sort of beautiful ordinary things that you take for granted and i think the project has become more poignant because of covid because we took so much for granted that all disappeared on uh on in march we worked in germany we worked with story lab from dortmund uh, university to create the video they're a research lab working in these immersive forms um, and some sort of technical stuff. So you, so you guys, just to share this stuff, we, we, we did the Milan footage in stereoscopic, which requires a very large camera. You can see there, uh, that's Constantine <laughs> in the water. Uh, he, he will do anything for the shot. Um, uh, so it's a very large round camera with six fisheye lenses, essentially three sets of two eyes. It produces a 3D image um, with, with depth and parallax. So when you move, you know, things look like they move behind it. So there's parallax. Um, uh, and so it's more real, but ultimately in Germany, we decided to go with this GoPro fusion camera, which has only two fisheye lenses, one on either side of the camera. You can see it there. It's quite, quite um, surreptitious. You don't, you don't really see it. It's in this, it's quite discreet. Um, and, and you can put it on a bike and stuff like that. Um, there was no depth to this, um, um, but there's a 360, obviously. The two big differences for our purposes was that this is not at all intrusive. Um, but more salient, the stereoscopic requires so much data that you have to manage. And, and so that's wrangling all of that was very, very difficult. And we had a month turnaround to do this. So, so to do this, to reproduce this is, is not easy. Um, so we went with that, with the fast turnaround. 
I see the difference between stereoscopic and monoscopic. Some people actually don't even perceive it or even can't even notice it. Some people find it even the depth to be a little bit um, disturbing. It could be a bit hard on the eyes. Um, in terms of audio stuff, um, we used a Zoom H3 VR for the sound atmosphere and had two sen sets of Sennheiser um, EW 112 PG4 GB band for the nerds out in the, out in the house. I don't know what any of those numbers mean, but that's what we used to get the dialogue. In terms of how we chose the shots, we just made the decision for the shots by asking the performers the same question posed to their characters. If you were lonely and isolated on Mars and about to, you know, considering killing yourself or whatever, where on earth would you like to visit? And what are your happy places and who are your happy people? And this was inspired by this, uh, this is interesting. I think it's a, it's a NASA, 2016 NASA evidence report risk of adverse uh, conditions, risk of adverse cognitive or behavioral conditions um, and psychiatric disorders. Uh, and they, they, they rate planetary travel. You can see down at the bottom, the planetary travel is rated uh, quite high. Um, and you have what the, the L up at the top stands for likelihood. And then C is the consequences on ops operations. What is the risk disposition of that and likelihood and consequences on long-term health. And four in both cases means death. Um, so they were, were, and I find this slide also kind of funny here. This is um, the, I mean, it's just risk management 101, but it's really funny. So exposure to radiation may affect central nervous system, which may affect sleep, which may affect individual performance, which may affect team performance. Yeah, no shit. So it was just a funny NASA report that's stating the obvious, but, but just the fact that isolation was one of the big things that they're concerned about and just how we've all been experiencing that. Um, so we had the basic shot list here. You can see the performers on one side and then um, the, the various places. So everybody had to shoot a, a quite an ordinary place. Everybody had to shoot a sort of beautiful place in their life in nature or something like that. Uh, two people had to do a scene with family. Three people had to do scenes with friends. The party sequence was everybody, but three people were, um, uh, were had to appear reluctant. And there was a scene of them sort of bored at the end of the party because they were the people that were leaving and, and the renegades. And then one of the renegades just sitting at the end and not going to bed while the others went, went to sleep. Um, and the voiceover test, tests, the voiceover texts that we made for the 360, which were performed live, were created by interviewing the performers while on location. Um, so that we're on location, we're, and again, a mindfulness exercise where we ask them to, to what they feel there, what they're thinking there, and what they, what they, what they do there, um, and it focused on this, this being in the present and that sort of thing. Here's Chris's text, which I'm going to ask him to read for us. Um, so you get a, a, just a whiff of the brilliant uh, Christopher Rojo in his performance. Anytime you're ready, Chris. He would normally do this in German. He's going to do it in English for us. If that's still kind of him. Right. Anytime, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, when I come into the store, I go over to the table with the novelties and look if there's something new for me. <laughs> then I go over to the action stuff and fantasy, then briefly past the erotic department and over to the comedy stuff. Then I do another round. Here I bought Comey Can't Communicate. In Comey Can't Communicate has Comey communication problems and cannot speak to strangers. But actually, she's quite popular. Her goal is to get 100 friends. On Mars, you either will click, click with the people or you won't. If don't, that's it. Your communication problems will be forever there. I'm not sure how I feel about that. So the highlighted text is, is what, what I wrote. Um, to start to lay down the plot that that Chris is not very much interested in the mission. And so adding lines like this and character stuff is always obviously in negotiation with the performers as they're, for the most part, they're playing themselves for all intents and purposes in some ways. And we never proceed without their content, which without their consent for the content, which, uh, you, which in any case is very difficult to do when you're working with kids and teenagers. If there's something that they don't want to do, they just simply do not do it. It's pretty hard to muscle kids, uh, I have to say. So um, the... So that's that's the script that is um, that is done as voiceover. The script that the performers perform live to the audience, which is the not the voiceover stuff, uh, but the the sort of more meditative stuff, had had two threads: the audience's beautiful ordinary days that they had to imagine, and then the Thunberg questions about interplanetary travel and colonialism. Um, that that stuff was in response um, quite a bit to to conversations I had in real life and on WhatsApp with with a Milan youth, Sarah Ben Hermuda. And Sarah 
is a deeply Thum Thunbergian youth and very passionate activist. Um, and, uh, and, um, and, and that's her there during, it looks like it's during the pandemic at a, at a, uh, at a protest. That, that's a picture from what, that's her profile pic from WhatsApp. Um, and then also I was inspired by a special issue of the Futures um, uh, peer reviewed journal, uh, which focused on the ethics of human colonization in the context of the 2018 social and conceptual issues in astrobiology meeting in Reno, Nevada. And there's lots of interesting stuff in this journal. I met uh, with one of the authors, a blind ethicist who insists that those with disabilities should be part of any colonizing mission. Um, I found that interesting and I asked her if she would feel comfortable putting her children on an airplane piloted by a blind person. Um, she laughed and said no, that, that, but noted that the technology is very close and that by the time we start sending people to Mars, all systems should be a go and that sort of thing. Um, then with the youth, we had two script writing workshops where the performers um, basically rewrote aspects of all of this stuff. So all of these questions, ethical stuff, they, they rewrote it, they retooled the ethical questions so that it was more in line with what they were thinking um, and, and so that it, it made sense for them to change the script in, in large swaths. So, so to sum up the performers involvement, they chose meaningful location through an interview and writing process. They provided a voiceover that, they, that, that we did through interviews. They rewrote sections of the script in particular aspects that were rated, related to the Thunberg stuff. And then um, Pascal, who's a drag artist, um, he made and designed makeup for everybody and, and he did everybody's makeup. Um, to take you through this, the schedule with working with the performers, obviously there was pre-production schedule meetings and stuff like that, but we had one Zoom meeting to introduce the project and get them thinking about the locations. Two days of writing with the youth, one week of shooting all the locations, one on each day and then some days for pickups and the party and stuff. Two weeks of devising, rehearsing while stitching and editing was happening. One week of the tech preview with an opening on Friday, so total together um, uh, with, that was a, a month. So, so now I'm just going to chat a little bit with Chris and just um, I just want to ask you Chris a little bit about um, your experience of, of us examining your life in this way and bringing a camera into your life can you just describe how did that feel would be was that an enjoyable experience did you feel it was an imposition uh, just tell us what that was like for you it was very interesting it's kind of like you you're making your life a little bit more action full more <laughs> more stuff is happening kind of you imagine sometimes you have these moments where you just imagine going to the moon or for example going to the mars and actually kind of doing it was right. it, it felt a bit odd but also it was kind of fun <laughs> And, and sharing, we would interview you and then share these, we would speak these thoughts that were as if your thoughts, like the what life was like going around when you'd go around Nemo, that comic store. Um, and do you feel comfortable sharing, you know, the fact that you walk, I guess it sounds like you walk past the erotic department. You never, you never pause into the erotic department ever, I guess. You can say yeah, no comment. I, yeah, <laughs> I mean, I look at it. I, I know a few things from there. Also, my sister recommended one. <laughs> okay, so. all right. Um, and what was it like having the, us come to your house and hang out with your family? Because there's a scene where we we hang out with your dad um, that we we kept in the in the project. Was that how did you and how, did you prep for that at all? I mean, a little bit. You think about how you want to present yourself. Do you do you want to uh, show the audience? Are you real or do you want to maybe address something so right. that you don't want to share? So you kind of right. have to think about what you want to share and what you don't want to share. Did, did, you, did, you, did you want some, to share something in particular? Is there some way that you framed yourself in a way that, was, that you highlighted something about yourself? I, I think I thought about it a lot like in the process with the places that I choose, but right. while I'm uh, I filmed it and did it, I didn't really think about it anymore. I just right. did it. <laughs> right. Okay. Cool. All right. All right. Thanks. Thanks. And people can ask questions and stuff like that. So um, I'm at the end of my presentation and just now leaving some time. If people have any questions and want to chat about this at all, happy to. 
happy to to in, engage with anybody or whatever we can any obviously feel free to leave now but um that's all i have also if jan is here too if you have any questions um she directed the the 360 video stuff on the ground because i was unable to be there um and um and i guess yeah so that's i yeah i mean i'm, gonna, I'm not gonna say anymore except to say that the the, the plot um, the, the plot of the youth abandoning the mission, um, uh, Yana doesn't like that. She thinks it's not mammalian enough and it's, 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 it's too drama-rama. Um, and I think in the end, I agreed. We may, and the thing, we didn't have any moment where the audience spent any time with the, um, with, the, with the youth getting to know them. They've seen them in the goggles, but they don't spend very much time in the show talking to them. And I want to figure out how to do that. COVID poses a big, big problem for that. But anyway, any, are, are, is, any questions? or anybody or comments or anything from anybody or not. Yeah, feel free to turn on your cameras and do whatever you want, turn on. Hey, Yana. Yeah, go ahead. I have a question, yeah. Um, I, I'm kind of worrying what, what was your like, what was your gateway in into this? Like what made you say, ah, we need to make this tell this story and 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 this is how we're going to do it with 360 video i'm curious to know what that path was like sure sure so so one of the things when you're working with when you're working with young people when you're working with anybody who's a, who is a non-artist obviously you have to create a very solid formal container for their fairly at times loosey-goosey content to work so here, here's some scissors, cut some hair as in, in haircuts by children. It's very clear what the, what the goals are there. And, and the more you get towards more sort of dramatic stuff, the, the more difficult that is to do without working with, with pros. And one of the things in, in this work that I've discovered is that obviously one of, the, one of the forms that is the most formal in some ways is, is film. Right, so you can you can you can interview or you can do a bunch of work with young people, and then you just edit it down to something that is really succinct and, and great. If you throw a bunch of young people up on stage and you're trying to be spontaneous on stage, especially when you're looking for spontane spontaneity, film you can record spontaneity, chop it down. So that's why we were moving toward film as somehow incorporating film into this project, and then and then it just was. I had been looking at VR just because a friend had a set and I was interested in VR in general. Constantine suggested doing that. And then it was like, oh, that let's, let's do that. Just, it was mostly like the youth will find that interesting. We'll all find that interesting. We've never done that. Um, and then that's when, then we when, once we had the, the 360 idea, it was like, oh, then we're in these places for real. Why are we doing this? Oh, we're making this archive to take to Mars. I did research. Oh, wow. Isolation is going to be a big problem for these interplanetary dudes. So this is a solution to this isolation problem. So that's that's the that's the path toward that. Cool. Thank you for sharing. I I love origin stories. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Cool. Why don't I show? I'm going to show you a video here of the. Uh, I'm going to share my screen and I'll show you just the the, the a trailer that we made. I forgot to do that. Um, so, and you'll get a sense of of what the show feels like. Um, here we go. So könnt ihr euch euer Erdenleben zu jedem Zeitpunkt in Erinnerung rufen. Wir sehen uns in 48 Stunden. Yeah, I mean, it, it, I think the, the trailer is more interesting. The, the, the show needs some work. <laughs> Uh, they just in, mostly in terms of that 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 plot that feels a bit like an imposition. Niana, do you want to say anything about it? 
and and the and that plot. Yana saw the show. I never saw the show. So so what 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 do you think worked? What do you think didn't work? We we've yet to debrief. We're going to debrief this week. But yeah, what do you what are you saying? Um, hi everyone. Um, I mean, there are many things that really work well. I think the meditation part and also um, when the audience talks to each other about their beautiful ordinary days, that works really well. Um, also watching the videos, spinning on your little chair, all of that works really well. And then at some point we're trying to, and you already said that I don't like the bit where we're trying to um, add a bit of a fiction story um, where the astronauts are having a big party before they leave and then the renegades don't go on the mission, but they stay here on planet earth and there's a police cop, like all of that happens like in the last 15 minutes. So uh, um, that, that, yeah, just confuses yeah. a couple of people, but yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think I think when we go for, well, going forward, for me, it's going to be really about how the young people who are astronauts. We've we've spent the whole hour watching them and getting to know them, but but I do still want to keep them away from the audience a little bit, and then have a moment where they come together and basically wish them well and thank them and send them on their way, kind of thing, and maybe talk to them a bit. I mean, COVID poses so many problems with that kind of thing. Just I really wanted, I mean, I wanted some hugging to happen, you know, when you're saying goodbye to these kids and you. But so there was all of these problems that COVID presented, but that's where that's where I'm hoping to go from it and figuring out how to have a conversation between them that's spontaneous. We, we considered having like almost like a press conference was one idea, but if the audience started to ask them, well, so how do you, you know, what food are you going to eat on Mars? Then the youth are going to have to improvise in a way or the performers are going to have to improvise in a way that's going to be, you never know what kind of thing and it's going to be hard to control that. So we have to come up with a way for there to be an interaction at that point, but that an interaction that has some, has some, formal constraints on it so that the audience can knows what they're supposed to do that performers know what they're supposed to do but yet we can honestly get together and get to know each other in that final goodbye moment is what i think where we're going with it or why i feel like going at this point yeah. so we got we're on, we're heading toward almost like a few minutes before we got maybe time for one question if anybody's got anything that they want to ask yeah go ahead ask a, a spencer yeah, hey. Um, I'm just curious if you could share, sort of, if you have a ballpark figure of what the budget was for the whole kind of like everything from the consultation, like youth programming, and then the final. Diana, uh, yeah, great question. Um, Diana, what do you think? Uh, I, oh, yeah, we, where were we? Like 30,000, 40,000, maybe? Is euros that? or euros or dollars um, euros, yeah. yeah euros i think um it was a little bit less but due to some projects that got cancelled due to corona we had some money that we could shift to this project um but in the end we thought the vr goggles would be the most expensive part but we were able to rent them for half a year and that was a pretty good deal so it was less than expected I mean, I could, if you, if you want, I could get an exact, or is that close enough, uh, I guess, as a figure? I mean, I could, I could find it out for sure. You, is that good? Yeah, I could enough? probably also look it up now. Oh, actually, I'd be curious if you, if you were able to share that. Um, yeah. yeah, sure. We, we can, we'll, we'll, I'll put that in the Discord or whatever. Are you in the Discord? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Jerry. Um, so and and just and and there was obviously there's money that was going into like the, the idea the way we work is we develop um, a project that is considered to be a model that we will then tour so the first you know there's a big investment off the top where we're you know all the time we spent in Milan and we'll go back and as we figure out exactly how do we do this thing then we try it once and then and then eventually it gets like with our other projects like all the sex I've ever had now is in a really great spot where where it's it's a model that multiple people can direct and we just go and we have a schedule and we know what we do every minute of the day this is not yet in that state eventually it'll get into that state so we're still working that out so that that involves a larger investment off the top yeah and we also we paid every perform performer and uh, we had to translate uh, so there were a couple of costs um yeah that might differ in the future um, Howard, Howard, Howard has a question about when do we decide on the performance space? The performance space 
it's a place, it's a place called Zesha 1, which is um, a new space that is being taken over in Bochum by youth. It's an, and the Bochum Schauspiel House is using the space to, to run all the youth oriented stuff and the community oriented stuff, I guess. Um, and then it's just, that's where we had to work because we were working with that, that team. Um, and so that's, I mean, it, it can be anywhere. I mean, it's just a, an empty room. I mean, black box without risers is, 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 is yeah. Is what, but it looks like we're at time here. So thanks, thanks everybody for coming. And uh, for questions, feel free to ask me on Discord or get a hold of me wherever, wherever you want. But appreciate the opportunity. Thanks, Aiden, for letting us do all of this. Thank and thanks, you. thanks, Chris and Yana. That was so great. Big up. Yeah, cool. So cheers, everyone, for coming out here. Uh, obviously, we have one last session going on. If you're interested in hearing a conversation about spatial design in XR, you're going to head over to presentation room B. If you're interested in the other conversation that's happening, ah, cultivating audiences, you're going to head over to presentation room A. Thanks so much. We hope to see you back in VR. Otherwise, enjoy your day. Again, thank you so much, Team Mammalian. Thanks. from wherever you are in the world. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. All right. Cheers. Take care. Thanks. Bye. Thanks.
Rascals, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Musqueam Nations. What logics are involved in crafting spaces for digital performance interaction? Leading us into this conversation is Ian Garrett from Toaster Lab fame. Hello, everyone. Give me just one second. I realize I have our live stream on too, and I want to make sure that I have turned that off. The monitor. Thanks everyone for joining us. I'm gonna. Uh, we have a, a really great panel here, um, especially in terms of um, actually coming up and figuring out what exactly we're even talking about here. Well, that's what we've been talking about backstage. So I'm gonna do uh, brief introductions. I'm gonna bring everybody out. Um, they're waiting in the wings. I love that we have this ability to um, completely <laughs> construct optionally our uh, our desire. To um, gather into a theatrical space, but we'll talk a little bit more about the things that we can and cannot do in a moment. So first, I'm going to invite Beth Cates to the stage. Beth is an award-winning lighting set projection and mixed reality designer. Uh, she started in rock and roll at 14, uh, and uh, has been doing lots of work associated with this. Part of part of steering this uh, event going on. You may have been with her workshop right before this as well. Um, she was most recently the virtual world lighting designer and virtual stage lighting designer for uh, Double Eye Studios VR Theater Performance Findings in Door X at the Venice Film Festival, a theater piece in the film festival, uh, which won Best Immersive VR uh, Experience, and just recently completed her MFA at uh, U Calgary, uh, where she's been doing research uh, between drama and computer science, uh, looking at VR, AR, and live performance. She also sits uh, on the uh, advisory board for Tister Lab, uh, which she chairs. Um, and next, I'm going to bring out Frank Lucas, uh, a mixed reality designer uh, who has a company. Uh, it's called Restos Reality yeah, Interactive. Uh, his background is in quality assurance, but now he works with companies to consult, design, prototype, and ultimately bring to fruition mixed reality applications and experiences. And we were talking a lot about how he's been doing that with HoloLens recently um, in the uh, uh, outside of this space. Again, weird that we're talking about being outside of places uh, for consumers, enterprise, and manufacturing. Has a lot of experience also um, within the video game space. And then I'll also invite uh, uh, David Rockaby, uh, who uh, is, uh, has, a, I could go on, uh, right now serves as uh, lecturer and associate director at the BMO Lab at the University of Toronto. Uh, he's been creating interactive sound and video installations uh, since 1982. Uh, his early work, very nervous, and is acknowledged as a pioneering work of interactive art, uh, uh, translating physical gestures into real-time interactive sound environments, uh, which, uh, without getting too far into um, just everybody's accolades, we because of the limits to the time that we have here. Thanks everybody for joining me on stage. Um, I want to use that sort of as a bridge because we were talking about uh, backstage, again, weird to think about this metaphor in this virtual space, going backstage about how that is a mixed reality practice, um, like before it was co-opted uh, by Microsoft as a trademarkable property of what mixed reality is. Uh, and getting to this question of what is, what are we talking about when we're talking about designing spatially? And we have like a preconceived notion. Well, we all share a bit of a notion of it in like, if we've been at this conference for a few days of, of a spatial practice, because here we are in a virtual space. Uh, but I'm going to turn it to our panel, making sure that you each have the megaphone um, uh, to ask you what when you're asked, uh, when you're asked, uh, when you when you were asked to be on a panel for uh, spatial design, um, what did you imagine that actually meant? So I'm going to I'm going to make sure that you're all on air, and that you've got the megaphone as you're up here on stage. Uh, David, I might start with you first because I, I I shortchanged a bit of your uh, uh, your introduction there. <laughs> Um, and you're like, you've got like just a storied bio there, but you've been working in different aspects of the space for a long time and now are uh, directing or are associate director at the BMO lab, which is looking at this in a, in a different way as well. 
like what are the different ways of defining virtual of spatial designs that you've that you've uh, let? Yeah, so <clears throat> I guess the strangest thing for me is that I started doing something that I guess you could call augmented reality with my interactive sound installations like Very Nervous System. And in that case, what it was is not so much spatial design as redefining new behaviors within a given space. So I was often going to a gallery and I'd have to put it in a gallery or I'd pose it on a street corner by pointing a camera out a window or something. So I was often interposing a new behavior on existing space or something like that. And in that case, the spatial design was actually very pragmatic. Um, and so not even worth going into where you point your camera, how you orient the space, except to consider questions of, of actually how people move around. And that became very much, I, I guess, a question that's relevant also in this context. But how do you design an installation, right? I would have defined myself as an installation artist in the 80s and 90s. And there, you're an artist who's not working with a sculpture or an image on the wall or a sound, but you're working with the space and redesigning the space to mean something. So I spent a lot of time thinking about what it means when you walk into a space, what you confront, what barriers are there, what do you see and what don't do you see as you enter and as you turn a corner, what's revealed, and how does the order that things are revealed speak to you? So there's kind of a architecture through which meaning was generated. And so even just us coming back from behind there has a certain story to it, that architecture, and that our movement through space and the way it, it guides us through space says something about that. But I would think about that in the context of the installations I was doing. Um, since then, I've done other things uh, involving space using things like the Connect or the Azure Connect now to construct, um, to design uh, behaviors in space sculpturally. So mm -hmm. where I can use my phone app uh, walk into the middle of the space, choose a sound, for example, and then press a button and say, that sound will be here. And then choose another sound and say, okay, that one's going to be on the underside of that sound. And then we're going to build, so I would build a three-dimensional volume of sounds in, say, a 60 by 30 foot space that you explore reaching through it. So that's, that's a very different spatial design sense, which I'm actually changing the character or behavior of things in the space and designing it, again, from a sculptural or installation perspective. Um, and then it's really, then space becomes story in a funny way, like how you encounter sounds, what sounds you encounter, what order changes the narrative you're spinning for yourself as you encounter them. So then it's kind of like sound possibilities as, as story space that you can move through. Um, so those are some examples of ways I've thought about spatial design. Yeah. I think I may come to you with the, the same question, coming at this from a very different practice, especially in terms of of using like HoloLens and AR and how those are blending two different types of spatialization. Like, what what? How do you approach spatial design? How are you thinking about that when you when you come into those conversations? Yeah, so it's 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 actually really interesting because you know when you're here in virtual reality, you're really only dealing with the digital, right? You can sort of make anything any size and kind of like you kind of have a little bit more, um, uh, you have a little bit more freedom with what you're allowed to create. When you're in augmented reality with something like the HoloLens, if you don't know, it's it's kind of like this VR headset, but you can still see the real world. Um, so you're designing on top of the existing reality, which makes it a little bit more uh, maybe difficult because you can't just go crazy um, because you still have to conform to the sort of physics of the real world. Um, but I think a lot of a lot of the sort of principles you get with normal sort of set design, and for me as a video game designer, my background is in a level design. Um, so you're kind of having those same thoughts in your head. You, you know, you're thinking, okay, well, what am I going to have my audience looking at at any given time, and what are they allowed to touch, and what are they allowed to kind of, you know, can they do anything, or are they just an observer in this world? And a lot of times they are. Um, but my my sort of the most interesting experience was I got to um, I got to help with a, a theater production, and it was it wasn't really a theater production. It was more like an advertisement, but we got you know real actors. We had people come in for auditions and wear the hollow lens and see how comfortable they looked with it, which was really interesting. But the most interesting part was um, when they put the thing on and we were doing the shoots. They weren't just acting out you know 
oh, this is what it looks like and this is what it feels like. They were actually using the technology um, that's on their head to you know, really sort of interact with what we were filming. So you look at a lot of old movies, you know, I'm a big fan of like Mortal Kombat. I don't know if I can say any Mortal Kombat. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you watch the like behind the scenes and you see, you know, Liu Kang, he's like fighting with this lizard that's not really there, right? And he has to pretend like it's real. Um, but here we got to see these actors who, who have done sort of things like that before, but they were actually doing it. You know, it wasn't like in my head and in their head and we were, you know, it was real to them, to us, to everyone. Um, so that's like another interesting thing. Um, but at the same time, if you're doing something like a, a installation or a demonstration, you can't give too much. So one of the sort of biggest takeaways for me was giving people things to play with when you're trying to tell them something, they're not gonna mm -hmm. listen to you. <laughs> right. <laughs> so that was like one of my early learnings, making all these prototypes in, in, in an augmented reality HoloLens headset because people are going to want to reach out and touch things, right? So, um, yeah, you got to find that balance. Um, yeah, that's a, that's actually a really interesting way to segue into asking this question of Beth because you just came from a workshop in AltSpace where people were using the tools for devising performance spaces, like doing the uh, like customizing sonography within unlimited space as long as it's available in old space as well um how did that a how did that go and b <laughs> um how does that relate to like the way that you approach thinking about spatial design and sonography okay that's a great question um i think it went really well um it was it was really fantastic to see what was created by more or less new adopters to the technology um, and with very we did put some pretty significant limitations on but to watch the inventiveness with manipulating space and we had everything like there was everything from live piano to curtains that opened right without without there being animations available to anyone it was using mm -hmm. the tools um, to create the space using the tools that existed to create space um, we had a like a promenade piece um, so people really um, got inventive with the all the dimensions of the space so both playing with scale and um and the lack of physics and so this is so in terms of approaching spatial design it becomes really interesting as we hybridize these worlds and and um uh i would say that since i started working in vr I wonder how much my approach has changed because because we're liberated from physics here. We can do anything. Um, the things that have become really interesting for me too, like Frank mentions, like um, the gamification of space is something that is um, requires an enormous amount of consideration and and has started to factor into approaches in, in spatial design, like how how do you introduce things that you do want interaction with in telling the story of the space without it getting in the way of the story of the space? Um, and so spatial design starts to become this like super multi-layered, a web-like creature mm -hmm. that is far beyond the flats and drops and uh, trucks of, of yesteryear. Um, which, which actually, for me, the the work in VR has opened up my brain a little bit in terms of how to approach those an more analog pieces, um, mm. uh, because there are no limits here, and so. Um, I haven't had trouble encompassing that, like including that in my thinking. The like I haven't had trouble letting go of the analog way, but trying to figure out what can we bring from what we're learning in in VR into the analog space becomes really interesting. Um, and so, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Oh no, no, no! Finish your thought because I have I have um, a follow up. Okay, I was just thinking too about what I witnessed of of the groups um, only and so there, for people who weren't there, there were four 
uh, what I called sonograph formers or sonographers or terraformers um, who had the ability to construct space and then they were working with other people in the group and there was a wide range of, of new adopters, old adopters, actors, writers, whatevers, people who were, who were makers um, and, uh, and, the, and to watch the, the really um, incredible liberation of exploration of physical space and then the placement of the sonic space and there was actors distributed like it was really it was really inspiring um and it was really wonderful to see so yeah um and on the subject of limitations i think that my my the question that i that i have to follow up with is that i had a i had well for the second time both times which have been as a result um uh of this conference uh i have uh, i have run into somebody um earlier before this session as i was um as i had helped people get into the um get into your workshop uh beth i had um sorry i'm gonna pop up uh that's one of the awesome things about this space <laughs> totally. uh, that, there is a message floating in front of me um <laughs> Um, so I, I'm gonna let that happen, and I'm gonna ask this question. So I ran into Frank and got introduced on the main concourse, and uh, like last week, as I was moving through the central room before coming to the presentation rooms, I uh, ran into Liam from uh, from Single Fed, and I ran into people. And every other interaction that I've had since March 13th has been pre-planned um, because of the limitations that we have. In what you're saying, in terms of thinking about the the way that limitations have been opened up, I, I, I would open it up to every uh, to everybody here who's been experiencing these like limitations of the way that we interact with people, and how might that have changed your idea of thinking about, it in whichever way that you're coming into thinking about space and programming space and the storytelling that goes along the space, how has that changed in this time when we don't really get out much? I think this is uh, this is something that um, so there's a, a guy named Kent By and he's um, a VR philosopher for lack of a better word. He runs this great podcast uh, called Voices of VR, and he and I have talked about this idea of, and he's talked a lot about it on his own too. But this idea of that that um, the hallway conversation, right? Like we've all been to conferences before and you do that bumping into, to people. And, and so in, in these kinds of social spaces, find thinking about the traffic pattern, right? Cause as we're porting, we're just leap making these leaps from one place to another. What can we do then with that spawn point that allows that, that kind of crossover? How do mm -hmm. we, how do we guide, um, how do we guide people through without having to take their hand and go, okay, follow me? Um, how do you create those those spaces where the hallway conversations happen in a place where you can just zap around? It's it's really interesting. And, and having been at, at several VR conferences in VR now, um, it's not being thought about. Um, mm. we're, we're, there, there are very traditional approaches to creation of space and like actually may, remaking conference rooms, like, <laughs> which is, <laughs> yeah. which is not exciting. <laughs> um, yeah, that was, uh, yeah, that was something that, that really strikes me as, as we're talking about the absence of limitations. We keep imposing familiar limitations on ourselves and for obvious reasons, mm -hmm. it's familiar, et cetera. But I find myself wondering. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a long history in computational arts of be before you had NVIDIA and AMD rendering engines, when it was all software to generate sense of space, it was relatively easy for an artist or an artist and a programmer to come up with alternative representations of space. And right now, mm -hmm. conventional Brunelleschi perspective, two-point or three-point perspective is pretty much baked in. And in fact, if you look at medieval art, the artist had the opportunity to say, well, this person's really important, so I'll make them five times as big, and I'm going to collapse this space because it's not important. And so I wonder if there are ways for us to explore, given the fact that we have the freedom, can we come up with ways to, you know, like maybe maybe social space should bend around me like like 
gravity, like we, we, we have gravitational waves around us. And so when I spawn somewhere, initially everyone's far away from me because I've created a kind of distortion and then people come to me slowly. Like maybe there's, you know, how can we uh, marry the potentials that this does, which opens everything up to the fact that we still want to be able to have those encounters. So being able to bump into someone is important, but, but you know, I was struck actually the other day, the first time I was in this room, and I had to keep maneuvering to be able to see what was going on. I'm going, why do I have to maneuver in a space where anything's possible? <laughs> why, or, or is that good? Like, or is that actually a good thing? Is it, you know, it was a funny mixture of experiences. And so I, I, I you know, um, there are artists that, for example, went as far as rendering inverse perspective, where everything is smaller the closer it is to you. <laughs> it's pretty hard to deal with, but it's pretty astounding <laughs> to, to, to challenge the sort of middle of the road reality that we tend to reproduce in these spaces. You know, to, to add to that really quickly, um, so I've been in VR a long, long time, right? Since the Oculus, I'm sure you've been in longer, but the Oculus days, not the <laughs> Oculus. But when I first started getting into it, I used to, like, I'm a gamer, right? So I like to try all the new sort of experiences. And one of the ones that I tried was uh, a massively multiplayer online RPG. And when I first booted it up and went into the world, everyone has an open mic and everybody's everywhere and you can hear everyone at almost all times. And I hated it. <laughs> You know, I was like, oh, I don't want to hear these people. It's it, it's too much, right? Like, but as the world changed and um, you know, the, the social interactions became less and less, I actually find myself gravitating more and more to those experiences. Um, and of course, they've really improved it a lot with things like, you know, the the uh, the bubble and things like that. So you don't have to get sort of that sensory overload. Um, but I just thought that was interesting the way that my sort of mindset changed. Um, that's it. That's all. Yeah, that's that's interesting because there's a there's a, a Jacob Nidzvicki who's um, part of cohort, uh, um, who, who will be is presenting it multiple times uh, throughout the conference. He and I were having a conversation about like what the idea with all these streaming, even just streaming performances, all of this is going to be online. Like we've uh, one of the things that we're missing is like the audience's ability to ruin a performance because <laughs> you don't have that open world like anybody could say something at any time sort of thing and you know that's one of the the conversations over the course of this this conference that's happened too is like do we use the mute everybody i think that the first opening like we're like yeah we're gonna mute everybody so that people could speak but then it's just like everybody stuck it gets stuck in like a dead silence so that it's like well let's leave it open and 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 people will sort of like navigate that, that space I, i'm also really interested in this idea of it can be anything for the toast web presentation we did last week um like we just didn't want to do a powerpoint and we did not get so far and alt space does not let you get so far from reality that it's not like recognizable as a space that you can occupy but we decided to do the presentation a different way where we put it up as banners of 3d objects in space led people around as opposed to like come see a, a screen like let's go into vr so you can watch me present virtually on a on a screen um which is like an interesting like you know we're very early in that um there's another thing that we were talking about backstage that i also wanted uh uh to bring up in terms of thinking about like ownership of space but we're gonna there's gonna be a conversation later in the conference about ownership of uh of like product or or, or ownership of the types of projects that you make but we started talking backstage like half of us are on uh, are on an Oculus. Um, half of us are not. Are on Vive Pros, and we were talking about it because, like, sometimes weird things happen with hands, and the tracking is sort of like calibrated to different things. Especially, um, you know, there's a couple of people that I've interacted with in this who are on like um, the, the the first Oculus Rift, which uses external trackers. It's very easy for a hand to wander away if it's not like if they're, they're calibrated or the occlusion is weird. Um, but we're also like. So those of us who are on an Oculus are on a Facebook platform and we're being tracked through space, right? Like we like for it to work, that literally has to happen. Like we can't participate on an Oculus without allowing Facebook to track our movement. And the Oculus too, which was announced like in various future headsets, they talk about like other like essentially bio information about our movement and the way that we interact with it, which is meant to improve our experience, but also like 
opens up this question of what's going to happen with that data. So I think that my question for that is, as we're thinking about like space, what do we think about uh, like the ownership of that space? It's something that's easier to and more obvious perhaps at times when we're in like carbon space, like we know who owns a building maybe, or when, you know, there's a clear definition between corporate or public or private land. Um, but now we're in this like weird place where we feel very free. We feel free to move around, but ultimately, you know, to make that happen, we have to give up some of that, like our movement through space and the ability to track the way that we move. Um, what are your thoughts on, on that? And knowing that those who are, aside from the fact that they're being tracked by everybody who's on an Oculus, those who are not on the <laughs> Oculus might have different thoughts about that and that you have a little bit, maybe you have a little bit more freedom to move. What do you think? The, the, uh, Florian Rotzer, a German theorist, wrote um, way back at the early, in the early days of VR that um, the dream of sort of infinite interaction and infinite freedom in virtual space comes at precisely at the cost of infinite surveillance. You cannot separate the mm -hmm. two. And that's a profound, you know, and so there is uh, this extreme contrast between the, the freedom in theory that one has in this space, but, you, but to get that freedom in this, not in this non, in this spatial non-space or whatever, you have to give away something uh, at the same time. So there's a, it's a sort of central paradox in most interactive technologies, the freedoms they open up carry with them these trade-offs. And so questions about privacy, the whole battle between, you know, uh, uh, tracking, the value of tracking data as for, for machine learning, for example, the value of tracking data for, um, for, the, for the commercial and sort of um, uh, selling of advertising, et cetera, versus the, you know, I guess it's, there's a sort of an Apple Google model there of, of mm -hmm. privacy. These are, I think these are really fundamentally important questions as you spend more and more time in these spaces. And um, it's really, it's, we have to become really aware, I think, of then the, uh, the motivations, the, 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 um, the, motiva the, yeah, the motivations that each of the, the, the platforms and the operators of the platforms and the people building the software have and consider the implications somehow. I mean, it's, it's a real mess, really. We yeah, have to figure out. Frank is without asking you to violate any potential NDAs, knowing that you're working in a more corporate <laughs> space. Um, how how is this has has this factored into some of the ways that you're working or or yeah? yeah. Would love to hear your um, thoughts. So this you know full disclosure, uh, I don't work for any of the big companies, the Facebooks, the Microsoft. I do contract work, so I'm not you know 100% affiliated with any of them. Um, and it's not something that gets into my sort of day-to-day -day so much, but I will say that uh, as the hardware manufacturer, they, they have to kind of add these new features, which are things that people are a little bit concerned about, things like eye tracking and you know the space tracking. Um, but I can say that at least from the Microsoft perspective that I saw, it wasn't something that, um, you know, that was uh, kind of like a high priority target gather all this data to use to, for advertising and things like that. It was more mm -hmm. for um, make the product better, make the hardware better. So while certain things were being collected, it's kind of like the Windows 10, you know, like opt in, opt out. Do you want to send us uh, sort of like um, your usage data, things like that. This, this kind of thing, you know, is being collected. Um, but as far as I know, none of these things were being sort of used for, you know, money gaming things like that so when, when i was sort of part of the project uh it, it didn't it didn't really enter my sphere you know i wasn't mm -hmm. i wasn't you know they weren't telling me that these things needed to be done or anything like that um yeah i, I, I don't know how much i actually have to add to that conversation um it wasn't really part of my kind of um, yeah uh, sphere but i can yeah. say that using a facebook headset I definitely am sort of cognizant to the to the, to the concerns, and I feel them too, especially once we start adding things like eye tracking. I, you know, then these companies could not only see where my head is looking, but where my eyes are looking, um, which mm -hmm. is another sort of ammunition uh, towards you know the the, the 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 ad concerns and things like that. So I definitely feel it, um, and, 
Yeah, there's a different feeling of like some sort of threshold after they announce it. Well, with the elimination of the Oculus name moving to like Facebook Connect yeah. and sort of like daring that and like the requirement for the Facebook account and, and those yeah. things like that, where it definitely feels like we've moved on from like a novel display technology, even though like to interact with a lot of these platforms, um, we were you know, signing up for accounts and things like that. Uh, but we've crossed over to like here, we're within a specific like corporate ecosystem in which we are, you know, uh, uh, a user. Beth, I wanted to give you an opportunity. I didn't, uh, didn't mean to stomp on your uh, response to that too. Not at all. I mean, it's like, how do you fight the, the many headed Hydra? Like it's, um, the thing that as a as a theater maker that the, the the oculus and like and like how many of you are wearing them now the thing that the oculus was like this great hopeful piece of technology that finally all our poor theater makers were going to be able to start to engage with these incredible things that i was seeing and that colleagues were making and 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 knowing that it's always been a Facebook product, like it, it's always had that that um, coating to it. Um, and mm -hmm. now it's really troubling. Um, and so like, I don't know, is it that we make subversive work with it until they shut down all our Oculuses? Like, I, I don't know, it's really, it's troubling. And it's certainly like, you know, it's been identified by, people like Jaron Lanier for years, right, how problematic social media is, and it represents, you know, the, the destruction of what the hope for VR has always been. Um, but maybe, like, and this is why this conference and other conferences similar to it is really uh, encouraging because maybe there's a way we find to break the system from within a little bit or, or subvert it or, um, or, or make art despite um, uh, these things. And, and, and um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. And we need regulation, right? Like that's what it comes down to. These monsters need to be regulated so that yeah. they don't devour all of our eye tracking. <laughs> um, <laughs> And uh, and there now I won't receive any funding from Oculus. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's been recorded. Well, it's been recorded on my headset. So right. like, and, uh, Mine... obviously, if you think your phone's tracking your headset, like, come on, uh, you, you, you got to believe that it is. But it's um, true. There's, um, yeah. The uh, um, uh, Andrew Simpri, who is part of Toaster Lab, and uh, I'm not sure if he's in the room right now, but I know he was in your uh, workshop earlier, so he's been in and out through the day. He, he um, We've been talking a lot about this recently, and um, before he came over to, to, to spend uh, a lot more, well, he did his PhD and has been doing much more art, uh, like art-focused projects, he spent many years at uh, IBM. Um, doing design research and they put a lot of money into developing things in Second Life. And so we've been having this conversation around like, what was the flexibility of that world versus this world? Like what are the, like there's an infamous incident of an, uh, a Second Life uh, event where people would just like have uh, uh, flying penises uh, come and like, <laughs> like the zoom bomb in virtual space. And that's not something that's possible in, in this platform as free as we are, where we're sort of still limited to, to the tools that are given to us. Um, I want to open it up to the audience for uh, um, conversation. And I know that we could continue to talk about this, but um, you know, especially people who, you know, you've been uh, in this space and maybe thinking about these things and they've been weighing on you for the last uh, uh, week uh, in the three days that we've been together. Are there questions from the audience and sort of considering any of these ideas uh, of space and how we start to work with space uh, um, in, these, in these different types of virtual environments? I can also add another shark to the room if you'd like me to. <laughs> <laughs> but no float, but More no shark. floating penises. But <laughs> no, that's not. I mean, I guess we could break into Unity and uh, not break into Unity. <laughs> but we could go over to Unity and design one and put it into a kit, and I can upload it. Like it's not impossible, but it seems like we don't. It's have a lot of work. I feel that. like there's a better use of time. <laughs> yeah, the shark I can just pull out of a, a, an available kit. Um, okay, so I'm gonna pull open. 
Uh, oh. All right. So now I've turned on hand raises. If you look in your lower right-hand corner, aside from the hand raise emoji that you have, this is a different thing. The lower right. Ah, yes. I'm going to turn on uh, uh, for a uh, two-spirit trickster here. You're on the air. You're on air. Oh, and you should amazing. be on the air. Oh, there she is. There Hi. you go. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Um, Hi. I wanted to ask, um, as people who've worked in the gaming industry and in this industry in general for a longer period of time, um, what your thoughts are in relation to, uh, I guess, like the girl gaming universe, as well as uh, anything that engages in uh, eroticism in general. Like, uh, I've been chatting about uh, stuff like dating sims and the way that they're not necessarily mm. respected, uh, despite that being a huge uh, industry that has its own economy and brings in a lot of money. So do you think they would understand that language in general, um, as well as like, like what it's like to create uh, work and find audience and space to present work that is more queer, more inclusive, uh, or more sexually liberated? That's an awesome question. Hi. If I may, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, I think uh, the more that we kind of like uh, mature this medium, the more we're going to start seeing uh, much more representation. But I think the the kind of for me at least, um, I think we've seen a lot of kind of like accessibility options for people that maybe don't want to, you know, be exposed to so many people like the bubble, you, you know. Um, the fact that you can make your avatar however you see yourself, I think, is a really sort of, uh, is a kind of maybe liberating experience for a lot of people. Um, and, I, you know, as I said before, I think as we mature, we're going to start seeing way more rep representation as people sort of understand the medium and can kind of, like, build for it. Because, you know, a lot of people uh, are making games still in two dimensions on a, on a computer screen for people to only consume in that one way. Um, so, as things just take time, I think we're going to start seeing a lot more of that. And I think it was just this weekend I was on Steam and I was just looking and I found, uh, like, I'm a big fan of visual novels. Um, a lot of Japanese visual novels I play in you know, 2D. I saw a 3D version, like, in VR where I could actually fully experience that, uh, that experience. You know, I could, I could have that experience in full 3D, which I thought was really cool. And that's the first time I've ever seen that personally, so I thought that was you know, really interesting. Yeah. I might, uh, I might ask you to respond next because uh, the, the one of the thoughts that occurs to me is like the, the, and this relates also to what Frank was just saying, in Pandora X, like the idea of Avatar as costume and the flexibility there and sort of the relationship there and talking a little bit about that, that process, it isn't quite get quite uh, as far there as we would, uh, we would like, but there was a lot of social, there's a lot of like social contract building around the way that character design, especially as it was animated by a live performer as opposed to an NPC worked in that space. Um, that it seems like there might be a lot of flex, still be a lot of flexibility on a platform, like a social platform like this, or even more so on VR chat where you guys were creating that. Yeah, and I think that, um, and so, so Finding Pandora X was a live VR theater piece that happened at the Venice Film Festival um, that had three live performers uh, and then a whole bunch of other uh, performer managers and then the audience also inhabited an avatar, which became a really interesting piece because we the that was the chorus and so everybody was made the same um and was kept pretty gender neutral um was and was kept um i mean we were we were a little bit spooky we were there were it was really evocative of a feeling um and then there was playing with those with the visions, the, and it's interesting because I'm reading my son from the Greek myths right now, and all of the 
the iterations of all of the gods are white, blue-eyed, blonde-haired. Um, whereas in Pandora, we really played with that and worked with the avatar designer. And so the hair was pink and Zeus was blue and and started to really um, dig into what what else is possible. Like, because you don't have to be the blonde, blue-eyed, white version of these characters. And, and it... And then the ability to shift um, midstream too, to the ability to inhabit these other embodiments of character becomes a really, really compelling place to start to create from and open up mm -hmm. things like like different modes of expression and different ideas of sexuality and um, in, in real time. Like it's it's super fascinating. And I do think, I agree with Frank, I think the more we adopt this and the more we expose people to working with these tools, the more stories we will begin to see, the more modes of expression we will begin to see that explode those previous notions. Like, um, you know, I, I, I've said it a bunch of times, like the, VR liberates us from the physics of of the carbon world. Um, it also then liberates us from the the world views that we hold and allows us to actually go inside, like you did in that novel. Like that's extraordinary, um, and to go inside and to 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 find those places. So I do think yes, it will it will increase, um, and yeah. and as we keep playing, yeah. Yeah, I think there was uh, having uh, getting a chance to see Pandora X. I also think about sort of some of the examples of, of different ways of thinking about space that David that you brought up, because uh, there were times at which like characters to change, like uh, to change like just their presence, like took up different amounts of space. They changed scale. We as a chorus changed scale, and that allowing people like. Even those simple things allow us to like sort of dissociate from like we are we are fixed in one form. We can also tell story through the, those changes that we can control from one character to another, re-manifesting into another avatar and making the dramaturgical connections there. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I find I, I find there's a there's an interesting. I find myself thinking about how we tend to imagine aliens in science fiction and how much mm -hmm. of a failure of imagination that usually is. And when I think about the same thing in terms of our inventing of our, uh, our avatars, I have the most banal and boring avatar possible because there was not an, an interesting enough range for me to actually want mm -hmm. to pursue uh, further. Um, uh, and yet the possibilities are enormous. But what we run into is the same thing we run into in terms of designing space. To the degree mm -hmm. that we have a familiar space, we can leverage all our existing social behaviors. To the, degree, to the degree that our avatars conform to a certain set of expectations, we can code them in very explicit ways, uh, encode ourselves to, 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 to speak in the language of the normal space. And so there's this always this tension between how much do I want to take on all the freedom that's available here to do, to be anything, and what do I lose in terms of any sort of presence in other people's imagination if I do that. And I, I don't mm -hmm. know how we negotiate that. It's a, it's, it, it, that thing which exists in the real world doesn't disappear here. <laughs> Just the, mm -hmm. the nature of the constraints is different, right? And so, um, you know, this is, a, this is a, a fairly boring, interesting gathering in terms of the visual presentation of it, although people have put some admirable attention into making their avatars a lot more interesting than mine, and I <laughs> applaud those, but this is, <laughs> this is really middle-of-the-road uh, reality that we're experiencing here. And, yeah. um, and, and we do that for a reason, and, and I wonder how we can find new ways of negotiating the space between the familiar communicative space that we already understand the rules of and being able to jump out of that space completely at times like how, i don't know there must be a way because there's a whole space of potential locked up in the fact that we're still figuring that out yeah it's um, really i know that i spent oh. oh sorry go ahead oh no i was just gonna say i know we're getting close to time but it, it's really interesting um, in one of the other metaverses that I that I go into is a place called Neos, and in Neos, there's a lot of really like heavy gamers, um, 
and they just build worlds and it's it's an incredible place and nobody nobody has uh, an embodied avatar like this. Mm. There are lizards. My 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 closest mm. friend in Nias is a piece of toast with jam, and that's how <laughs> he's known to everyone. Medra is a piece of toast with jam, and uh, nobody is is humanoid in any way. And some people are particles, and it's an, it's such an incredible way to engage with them. It feels like being in Star Trek, right? Like Next Generation managed to get beyond the humanoid alien sometimes and so like there is a giant ball of jelly that changes shape and uh and that's who we get to talk with and that's uh, it's awesome it's so great um yeah and there's it's a really... lot of early a lot of early star trek that my my mother referred to as just everybody had a different skin condition and then <laughs> <laughs> some character design came into it it was like let's let's get beyond this um we, there is a question that has been posed i'm going to invite that to have it in a post uh session conversation because we're at time i apologize for that this has been really a great conversation i will admit uh i will admit that i spent the first month of being in alt space uh very much a uh a typically hued person you would have been able to easily <laughs> identify me in alt space as a person that you would have met and then at some point i'm like I, there's no reason for me not to be blue and i was like well you won't be able to tell i have fingernails unless i make them orange so uh, it became more of a design question uh, and moving on there so um uh thank you all. i want to move it into a conversation i think that they gave us uh, like like Think about all the limitations as we move into the last day of, uh, of this convening. Um, and we're thinking about the opportunities that you have for here as we've introduced a lot of people to this platform who think about space in this way. Like, also, be, please be thinking about how you can break it, um, both mm -hmm. as, a, as, a, as a, a virtualization of physical space and as a corporate space um, and as like an embodied space. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Somebody asked. I've turned on the